Hello. My talk today is about unpacking an accidentally commercial game. My name is Ren Breyer. You can find me on Twitter at Renegade. I've been in games for about nine years now. I do art direction, design, and biz dev work at Witchbeam Games. Witchbeam is best known for their previous game, Assault Android Cactus, which is pretty much the exact opposite of the game we're currently working on there called Unpacking. I'll play you the trailer so you can get a good sense for it. Almost all of my work in games has been on mobile games. I used to work at Halfbrick doing art for their two flagship titles, Jetpack Joyride and Fruit Ninja. Jetpack is the one game I spend the most time working on, and it's where I honed my pixel art skills. I briefly worked at Playside Studios on Kubo, A Samurai's Quest, and after that I worked at Well-Placed Cactus on a couple more mobile games and on a white label project. About half of the work I've done is mobile games you've never heard of. Some of them, unfortunately, never came out. While I like the games I work on, the kind of games I really enjoy playing are indie console and PC games. I like games that tell a story, games that innovate, games that stick with you, like Gone Home and Papers, Please. I also like chill, relaxed games that allow a lot of room for self-expression, like Animal Crossing. Unpacking is a cross between the kind of games I have experience working on and the kind of games I like playing. Obviously, Unpacking is similar to Jetpack in that it's pixel art, but it's also similar to a lot of mobile games in that it's fairly casual and is centered around a single, simple mechanic. Unpacking started off as a side project for me and my partner Tim. We're both game developers and have always wanted to make some kind of small game together because why not? We have complementary skills, and it seemed like it could be fun. Along the way, though, Unpacking ended up becoming the next title of Tim's studio, Witchbeam. The studio is funding the project using money from their previous game. We've received additional funding from Screen Queensland, our state's funding body for film, TV, and games. We've even signed with a publisher to help us with marketing and PR. We plan to release Unpacking sometime in 2021, and our Steam wishlist numbers are looking promising. So how did this all start? Well, the idea for unpacking first came about in early 2018 when my partner Tim moved in with me. We were unpacking his stuff and found the experience to be kind of game-like. Whenever we finished unpacking one box, we'd unlock the box underneath. We didn't bother with labeling, so we didn't know what was in each box, meaning that each item that came out could be a delightful surprise. It was fun completing sets of items that were split among multiple boxes. And it was especially fun finding interesting ways to arrange these items in their new home. The idea stuck with us, and we imagined rules that it would let us mimic the ritual of unpacking in a way we thought would be fun to play. The final piece of the puzzle was realizing I wanted to tell a story using this framework. The game would follow a character through the important moves in her life. The player could learn about her circumstances through the items she keeps and discards, and the settings she finds herself in. Our plan for the game was to have a simple core mechanic, like many of the mobile games I worked on. 
the game would have multiple levels, all threaded together with a narrative about the life of one character. We would tell the story entirely through items the character owns and the apartments she moves into, much like the storytelling of Gone Home, but with the low fidelity of pixel art and almost no text. Early on, we figured out we wanted this to be a Zen game, Though unpacking isn't seen as a calming activity by a lot of people, we felt there was something soothing about it, and we wanted to bring out the best parts of the experience so everyone could feel what we felt. We wanted to remove the stresses of real-life unpacking, but we also wanted to purposely not include the more stressful and judgmental aspects common to games, like timers and scores. We thought of unpacking as real-life item Tetris turned back into a game, but we quickly realized there existed a tension between letting the user express themselves through putting items wherever they liked and keeping unpacking a puzzle game that had to be solved. We liked that tension and decided to keep it, carefully balancing the puzzle aspects with the self-expression aspects. Over the next month, we created our initial prototype. One room, a kitchen, along with a bunch of items. I chose to start with the kitchen because I wasn't ready to tackle the storytelling and wanted to test out the mechanic first. Coming up with items to fill up a kitchen seemed easier than items for a living room or a bedroom, which tend to be more personal and personalized. Tim put together a grid-based system uh, for placement and made the items come out of a couple of boxes. People seemed to like it. It wasn't even a finished level, but players were already finding ways to personalize their kitchen through their item placement. It was easy to pick up, and even a friend's young kids who played it immediately understood what to do. Everyone's unpacked at least once in their life, so they get the concept. Very early in our month of prototyping, we heard that Stugan had just opened up for game submissions. I had known about Stugan for years at this point, because a couple other Australian and Kiwi devs had gone there. It's a non-profit games accelerator program that gathers a bunch of indie devs together in a remote cabin in the woods in Sweden to work on their dream games for two months with full room and board. Mentors are invited to give talks and one-on-one -on -one advice to the developers about their games. I wanted to apply in previous years, but I didn't have a solid game idea back then, and I was also working at various companies at the time, which probably would not have appreciated me suddenly leaving for two months in the middle of a project. But at the start of 2018, I was freshly unemployed and freelance work was slow to start back up. And Tim was between projects at his company Witchbeam, working on prototypes to figure out what their next game would be. And hey, we had a game idea we could submit. I didn't think we had much of a chance of getting in. It was an international program and very competitive, but we figured it didn't hurt to try. Having Stugan as a goal helped us stay focused as we developed our game. Somehow, we got in. We later learned that over 400 teams had applied. 15 teams were accepted. We spent two months in Sweden, from mid-June to mid-August, working full-time on unpacking with no interruptions or distractions. We had an amazing cohort of peers we're still friends with to this day. The mentors were incredibly helpful. Their advice helped us shape our game and also helped with the business and marketing decisions we would make in the future. At the end of our stay, we showcased our games in Stockholm to a mixed crowd of industry folks and the general public. By this point, we had a vertical slice of the game. Pretty much all it was missing was sound effects and music. We were really happy to see that players of all ages enjoyed the game. A couple of publishers that played the game seemed interested too. Before we got back, Tim and I had started talking about maybe moving overseas. The industry in Brisbane was small, freelancing was feeling stale for me, and I wanted an opportunity to grow at a big company in a city with a bigger industry. I even interviewed for a role at a studio in Stockholm. We felt unpacking had potential, but it seemed extremely niche. One or two publishers showing interest in a game is a very long way from a publishing deal. The game also turned out to be bigger than we had anticipated. I couldn't keep working on it full time. I needed a job with a salary. Anyway, it was time to return to Australia and return to reality. I kind of dreaded the end of our Stugan adventure. I was worried that returning to real life after what felt like game dev summer camp would be difficult and depressing. This is not what happened. We landed back in Brisbane in the middle of August and over the next two weeks, everything changed. Two days after we got back, 
still extremely jet lagged, we showed unpacking at Go43, our local yearly games exhibit. Caitlin Boucher from Screen Queensland played the game there and told us we should apply for funding. The deadline was only 10 days away, but we decided to go for it, and I spent a week working full-time on the application. Three days after the show, Tim and I posted our very first tweet on the Unpacking Twitter account. It was a sped-up gif of our kitchen level being unpacked. We had previously posted work-in-progress content of the game to our personal accounts, but the reaction to this gif was far beyond anything we had experienced up until then. In two days, the account went from two followers to over 7,000. The GIF had over 10,000 likes and thousands of retweets. Someone posted it to GiffyCat and shared it on Reddit, where it was viewed over 100,000 times and ended up on the front page of Reddit Gaming. In less than a day, publishers started to get in touch with us on Twitter. It was incredible and honestly overwhelming. On the 28th, we submitted our funding application to Screen Queensland. By this point, Jeff Van Dyke, joined us as our sound designer and Tim's company Witchbeam picked up Unpacking as its next project and hired me. That's the story of how Unpacking accidentally became a commercial game. But how accidental was it really? Did we just luck out with our little hobby project? Well, when we started Unpacking, Tim and I were both professional developers. I had seven years experience at the time and Tim had 14. All the games we had worked on up until that point were made with the intention to be sold. Because of this, when working on unpacking, our instinct was to design it as a polished, complete experience that would be suitable to sell. We also had a lot of friends and acquaintances test the game from very early on to ensure it had appeal. We had a clear development plan and a solid vertical slice of the game by the end of Stugan that showcased near final gameplay, tech, and art. The game was novel and intended for an underserved niche, which was very much on purpose. We had some luck here in that our niche was much bigger than we had anticipated. Another factor was that we were proactive from the beginning. First, we submitted the game to Stugan, and while we were there, we applied to two different shows, submitted a conference talk, and accepted an invitation to give another. We didn't always get into everything we applied for. Our talk submission got rejected, and so did our submission to one of the shows but we tried for everything we came across. We also kept sharing content from our prototype as we worked on it and kept active in the local and online games community. Going viral was definitely a fluke. It's not something you can plan, but it is something you can improve your chances for. What we did before and after going viral was not an accident. The way we developed unpacking was similar to how some other indies I've encountered have developed theirs. If you want to give this model a name, I'd call it the open indie development model. The development team builds a prototype or several, and instead of being secretive about it, they share their ideas with the world. Sometimes an idea gets a lot of attention, sometimes it doesn't. If an idea seems particularly promising, the team pursues it as a commercial product. This is what happened with unpacking, half accidentally, half on purpose. Thinking about it in retrospect, Peter Henriksen of Landfall Games gave us a talk at Stugan where he mentioned that his team does exactly this to decide what to work on. There are several advantages to this model. When working on early prototypes, the devs get to be very creative in their experimentation. Indie games can't compete with the tech or sheer manpower behind AAA games, so instead they thrive on being innovative, novel, and personal. Those things are riskier, and AAA companies are risk averse. Even tiny companies don't want to take unnecessary risks, but in a rough prototyping stage, it should be anything goes. The commitment to any one prototype is low. There is no expectation that any of these ideas has to be a moneymaker, they just need to be interesting. In Unpacking's case, if people hadn't gotten excited over it, Tim would have picked a different prototype as Witchbeam's next project, and I would have kept working on freelance or found other work. The biggest advantage is being able to gauge public interest early, before putting years of work into a game. This, in turn, helps opportunities come to the developers, as publishers and investors love a low-risk project. There are downsides to this model, too. Because unpacking caught people's eye so early in development, we've had to keep our audience engaged this entire time. While that's been helpful in slowly building up our audience more and more, it's also been a big time investment. 
there is a danger in revealing too much content early on, so there is only so much we can share. Media outlets will want to give their audience an exciting scoop about the game that they haven't already read elsewhere. If everything is already revealed, the press are less likely to cover it, which can interfere with the game's release plans. Even for fans, if we show too much, people might feel like they have no reason left to play the game. If a developer reveals a game idea that's clever and novel, but relatively easy to reproduce, there's a risk that a copycat will try to beat them to the punch with a cheap, hastily made knockoff. This famously happened with Vlambeer's Ridiculous Fishing, and more recently with Jacob Janerka's floppy gun first-person shooter idea. One more risk is getting a false positive. An idea might attract a lot of attention because it makes for a funny gif, but that might not translate well into an entire game. Validation from the internet is just one metric, not a guarantee of success. So back to unpacking. In January 2019, we started full-time development. We now had Jeff on audio and Angus on pixel art alongside me, because this game requires a ridiculous amount of artwork. <laughs> Besides the four of us, we occasionally hire short-term contractors for specialized roles to lessen our load and speed things up. Every person on the team handles multiple roles, and many of our roles are shared among multiple people. In my case, I'm responsible for art direction, as well as actually creating in-game art for items and environments, so these days, Angus creates more in-game art than me, and I just direct him. I do all of the UX and UI design for the game, from concept to final in-game assets. I designed all the levels in unpacking, though Tim helps me with improving and balancing them. I manage the project, making sure we're on track, organizing our milestones, running our sprints, and keeping an eye on our finances. Tim and I share a lot of responsibilities, game design, narrative design, social media management, and the business side of unpacking, what I like to call the indie hustle. The indie hustle is where a lot of our time ends up going as indies, rather than on actual development. In my eyes, this is the kind of work that turns a hobby project into a commercial one. It brings your game attention, money, and opportunities. This is the hustling that we did for unpacking. We pitched unpacking a lot. We made multiple pitch decks with some helpful advice from industry mentors, and we pitched the game to several publishers, an investor, and two platform holders. During the pitching process, we decided that Witchbeam would cover Unpacking's development costs. This gave us more flexibility when talking to publishers, as what we were now looking for was mainly assistance with the game's release. One of our pitches led to a publishing deal nine months later. We applied for any grants we could. In our case, that was mostly Screen Queensland funding. One project grant, two domestic travel grants, and one international travel grant. I also applied for two GDC scholarships, which are basically grants for attending GDC. Both were for leadership programs for underrepresented developers. I got one of the two. We got a lawyer and negotiated several contracts. First, we had to negotiate the company setup, which we already existed, but we needed to negotiate IP ownership, percentages, and the like. Then we negotiated our contract with Screen Queensland for their project grant and the contract with our publisher. This is definitely my least favorite part of indie development. We showed unpacking at so many places. First Stockholm, then Brisbane, then Day of the Devs in San Francisco at Double Fine's invitation. The next year we showed it at GDC in the wonderful Mild Rumpus Zone, an area for weird and offbeat games. We showed the game at Bit Summit in Kyoto, where it was nominated for three categories and, funnily enough, won none. Then we did three shows in Australia, one at Avcon in Adelaide, Tim's hometown, another at Go43 in Brisbane, and one at PAX Australia in Melbourne. Most recently, we showed Unpacking at PAX Online. Tim and I have given several talks about Unpacking. We spoke about it together at Parallels in 2018, and I gave game design talks about it in 2019 at Game Development Brisbane and GCAP in Melbourne. Now I'm here talking to you about it. We also do interviews about the game for websites, podcasts, streaming channels, anyone who asks, really. An important part of the indie hustle is networking, making friends with other folks in the industry, and helping each other. An example of how networking has tangibly helped us with unpacking is when we reached out to Petter, who I mentioned before, to tell him unpacking unexpectedly went viral. He immediately put us in touch with an investment group he was working with. Another example was Tim's business partner, Sonatan, putting us directly in touch with a publisher to pitch to thanks to their prior relationship with Witchbeam. 
For the entire development cycle of Unpacking, we've had to maintain a good social presence, usually posting weekly to the Unpacking Twitter and updating Unpacking's mailing list whenever we had some big news. We keep an up-to-date press kit for the game, and this year we revamped the whole Witchbeam website to include a nice landing page for the game. If you Google Unpacking in Australia or the US, Google provides a knowledge panel about the game, and our website or Steam link is the top result. While I'm proud of our hard work, it took a toll. There have been many times when Tim and I completely lost our work-life balance, working on the game all day, every day. Because we're a couple, I joke sometimes that our lives revolve around unpacking like it's our child. We've both experienced burnout on this project and have had to take breaks here and there, or at least slow down to be able to keep going. I actually got really sick during Melbourne International Games Week in November 2018 with both a sinus infection and some strange symptoms that months later I would find out meant I had multiple sclerosis. While the causes of MS are not well understood, we do know that stress is a contributing factor. After spending all of Games Week sick, I took a course of antibiotics to recover just enough to go to San Francisco for a few days to attend Day of the Devs. The wildfires raging in California at the time blanketed the Bay Area with smoke, which definitely did not help my still recovering respiratory system. Just over a month later, I camped at the Woodford Folk Festival for five nights as, a, as I had a freelance gig there running pixel art workshops. Remember, I was still working as a freelancer through all of 2018, and in the last half of the year, contracts really picked up. I did all of this while experiencing an MS flare-up, at that point not yet diagnosed. Through 2019 and 2020, I learned to listen to my body and work more sustainably. I slow down when I have to. I take naps. I take weekends off. When opportunities come up, I weigh the costs and benefits more carefully. I don't try to go to parties every night at Games Week or GDC. This year we did just one show, PAX Online. Other than that, we just chipped away at our game, day in, day out. We made more progress than ever and ended up with even more wish lists and coverage than we managed to get in previous years. Pacing ourselves ended up being a net benefit. So, how do you end up accidentally commercial? You find an underserved niche in the market, you make yourself visible in your community and make your game visible to your potential audience early on. You apply for every opportunity you can, even if you don't think you'll get it. You build a good network of peers and mentors, and importantly, you pace yourself so you can keep your work sustainable over the entire course of development and beyond. Thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on Twitter or via email, and I'll do my best to answer. Have a great day.